Hi girls, this is the lesson for Monday, um, May the 4th. That is Star Wars Day, in case you're not sure. I'm going to write that right here. May the 4th. All right. So, we're going to be on page 679. We're skipping ahead to the last two sections of chapter 12, since we've run out of year and we're not going to be able to cover the entire chapter. I've just chosen the last two because it's things I don't think you've ever seen before, but I don't think you'll have a lot of trouble understanding. Um, before we get started with this, we're going to do a quick review of um, probability, which is at the very top of the page under the check skills you'll need, um, it's just because it's been a while since we've done a lot with probability. So let's look at number one. It says, the probability of rolling an even number you're doing a dice, okay? So the probability of rolling an even number. So how many possible outcomes could we get when we roll an, a dice? There are six. How many of them are even? Well, you've got two, four, and six, so that's three. And that reduces to one out of two. So the probability of rolling an even number is one out of two, all right? The probability of rolling a prime number. All right, so we've still got six possibilities. So I'm going to write them out here to the side there. One, two, three, four, five, and six. So which of these numbers are prime? Remember, two is neither, I mean, one is neither prime nor composite. Two is prime, three is prime, four is not and five is prime and six is not. So we've got three prime numbers. So three out of six, which is the same thing as one half. All right, number three. What's the probability of rolling a number greater than five? Well, there's only one number greater than five, and that's six, and there's still six possibilities. So one out of six. All right, and number four, the probability of a negative number. Well, as you know, there's still six possibilities on a number cube, but none of them are negative. So the probability of rolling a negative number is zero. All right, so let's look at number five there. Whoop, sorry, that's for the... Let's, let me scoot them down a bit. Okay, so number five, the probability. Okay, so you've got a different situation. You've got a blue dice, a blue number cube, and a yellow number cube. Still same, one through six. All right, so the probability of a blue number one and a yellow two. All right, so what's the probability of rolling a blue on the, a one on the blue cube? Well, it's still six possibilities one is favorable one is what you want and there's only one one all right on the yellow one there's still six possibilities only one of them's a two and remember when you need two th two events like this you multiply them together so the probability is one out of 36 to roll a blue one and a yellow two all right and then number six the probability of a blue even and a yellow odd. All right, so the probability of a blue even, well, there's six possibilities. How many of them are even numbers? Two, four, and six are even, so that's three, so one half. And odd is still six possibilities. How many of them are odd? One, three, and five, that's three, or one half. We'll multiply them together, and we get one out of four. And that's the probability of a blue even and a yellow odd. All right, so you remember that. So we've got three books here in this little investigation in the middle of the page. And I just abbreviate them. We've got A Midsummer Night's Dream, To Kill a Mockingbird, and I Never Promised You a Rose Garden. It's three books. The first question says, in how many different orders can you read the books? All right, so you've got to read all three of these books. You can read them in whatever order you want to. So I'm just going to abbreviate them D, K, and G. Okay, so you could 
read them in the order that they're given. D, K, and G. All right, let's switch up the last two. You can read D, G, and K. Okay, let's read the Kill a Mockingbird first. Then we could read uh, Midsummer Night's Dream and the Garden Book. And then we can flip the last two. All right, then we can start with the garden. And we can read Dream and Kill. And then we can flip the last two. All right, and I think that's pretty much it. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six different orders in which we can read these these three books, all right? So it says, describe how you determine the number of different ways you could order the books. Well, you could just make a list like this. That would work as well. Um, suppose you chose one of the orders at random. What's the probability that you'll read the, or, read the books in alphabetical order by title? Okay, let's do by Arthur. That's a little easier because this one's Shakespeare. And I think I misspelled his name. Oh, well. This one is Harper Lee, and this one is Green. All right, so in alphabetical order, it would be the Garden Book, then To Kill a Mockingbird, and then Shakespeare. So that's alphabetical order by Arthur. And how many of that order do we have in our list down here? Whoop. We just have it right there one time. So the probability, if you choose one of these ways at random, that you're reading them in alphabetical order by the Arthur, is one out of six. Okay? Easy enough. It's just that the question was a little strange. All right. So let's flip the page and look at example one. And it's talking about using a tree diagram. Now, tree diagrams are good if you only have a few choices and you're not having to make very many choices. Um, they get kind of tedious if you get to too many choices. Okay. It says, suppose you have three shirts. Hang on. My iPad's behaving funny. All right, so three shirts and two pair of pants. And you want to know the different, the possible different number of outfits that you can make, all right? So we're gonna start out by listing our shirts. We've got shirt one, shirt two, and shirt three. And you have to leave a little space because of the way that we're gonna have to make this little tree. All right, I'm gonna switch to a different color. So we've got pants. All right, with shirt one, you can wear pants one or pants two. With shirt two, you can wear pants one or pants two. And with shirt three, you can wear pants one or pants two, all right? So how many different kind of outfits do we have? All right, so here we have shirt one, pants one. Here we have shirt one and pants two. Here we have shirt two and pants one. Shirt two and pants two. Shirt three and pants one. Shirt three and pants two. Now these are all different outcomes that we've got right there. How many different outcomes do we have? We have six different ones. It says, on check understanding, it says, suppose you have two t-shirts and four pair of shorts you could bring for gym class. Make a tree diagram to find the number of possible outfits for gym. All right, so we'll make another quick tree, tree diagram. So we have two shirts, one and two, and we have shorts. So, we have how many shorts? Four. So, one, two, three, and four. One, two, three.
three, and four. One, two, three, and four. One, two, three, and four. Okay, so we have all these different outfits. We could have shirt one, shorts one. It's going to be both S's, sorry. Shirt one, shorts two, shirt one, shorts three, shirt one, shorts four, shirt two, shorts one, short, shirt two, shorts two, shirt two, shorts three, and shirt two, shorts four. You get the idea. So there's eight here, eight different possibilities of outfits. Now, if you notice up here, we had three shirts, two pants. Three times two is six. And down here, we had two shirts, four shorts. Two times four is eight. All right. Just to let you see. All right, so look at check understanding B. It says, would you want to use a tree diagram to find the number of outfits for five t-shirts and eight pair of shorts? Would you want to do this for five shirts and eight pair of shorts? I'm going to say no, because we already know there would be 40 different combinations, and that would take a little while to list out. So a tree diagram is not practical when your numbers start getting much bigger than four, or three or four, or something like that. You don't want to get too much higher. So whether you choose shirt, this shirt or that shirt or these shorts or those shorts, whatever, those are called independent events. The shorts you choose don't depend on the shirt that you choose. Those are independent events. And when you've got two independent events, you multiply the numbers together. It, um, look at the rule there. It's the multiplication counting principle. If there are M ways to make a first selection and N ways to make a second selection, then you multiply them together to see how many possible selections that there are. So five shirts, eight shorts, you've got 40 different outfits, okay? A lot of different ways that you can put things together. Let's skip to the um, check understanding too. It says at the neighborhood pizza shop, there are five vegetable toppings and three meat toppings, okay? So five vegetable, three meats. How many different pizzas can you order with one meat and one vegetable? So the, the meat you choose doesn't depend on the vegetable you choose. They're independent. So we just multiply them together and you get 15 different ways of putting your pizza together. Okay, no problem. So let's look over at finding permutations. Now, permutations is probably something you've not ever heard of before, but I think you're gonna get it because it's just a weird word, it's not hard. Okay, so a permutation is an arrangement of objects in a specific order, okay? So what we've been talking about, there's not really an order to it, but in permutations, there is an order. So the way that you can arrange the letters A, B, and C, how many different ways are there to arrange it? That's a lot like the books that we did at the beginning. In fact, it's exactly like the books we did at the beginning. In the book you here, you've got A, B, and C. You've got B, A, and C, C, A, B. You see the order, how many different ways can you arrange things in a different order? That's a permutation, is an arrangement of objects in a specific order. So let's look here at the baseball team. We've got all these different baseball players, okay? And I'm just gonna number them one through, um, one through nine, because you got a whole baseball team. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So each of these numbers represents a player. All right, and so the question says, how many different batting orders can you have with nine different baseball players? All right, so we've got these different slots that we need to put a baseball player in. I think there's nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so how many choices do we have for which player goes in that spot? We have nine choices, okay? Okay, let's just say we put... 
this guy in there. We're not going to worry about putting in there. All right, so how many choices do we have for the player that can go in right there? Well, we took one away, so now we've got eight choices. Okay, so let's take away that one. I'm just doing them in order. You don't have to. All right, so how many choices do we have for who can go right there? Well, there's seven players left, so we put seven there. All right, let's take away that one now. So now how many players do we have to go in this slot? One, whoop, sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, so how many players do we have to go in this slot right here? We have one, two, three, four, five, six players to go right there. All right, so let's take away that one. How many players do we have to go in that slot? One, two, three, four, five players left that we can choose from. All right, and so we'll mark off just number five for fun. All right, how many players do we have that can go in that spot? One, two, three, four are left. Okay, so let's mark off that one. He's got a spot. How many players are left for this spot? Well, there's one, two, three. There we go. All right. How many spots do we, how many players do we have to choose for that spot? Well, there's just two. And then when we mark off one of those, there, of course, is just one. No. And so everybody's got a spot now. Okay. So how do we find out how many different orders there are for this one? Well, we multiply all of these numbers together. Okay, so you're gonna need a calculator. So we will multiply nine times eight times seven times six times five times four times three times two. You don't have to do the times one because it's not gonna change anything. And we get this great big number of 362,880 different ways of rearranging these nine baseball players into a batting order, okay? This is, when you do this all the way down like this, nine times all the way down to one, it's called nine factorial factorial. I think it's got an I in it. Non-factorial. And it's nine with an exclamation point after it. And that implies nine times eight times seven all the way down. That's what this means right there. Just so you'll know, if you see this notation, you'll know what it means. Okay. So let's look at check understanding number three. It says a swimming pool has eight lanes. In how many ways can eight swimmers be assigned for a race, all right? So how many different ways can we do that? We've got eight slots and eight players. So we've got eight choices for the first lane. For the second lane, we've got seven choices, then six choices, then five choices, then four, then three, then two, then one. So, how many different ways can we arrange those eight players in the eight lanes? Well, eight times seven times six times five times four times three times two. I don't have to do the times one. All right. So it's 40,320 different ways that they can be arranged. Okay. No problem, right? So, there's a notation that you need to be aware of. It's called the permutation notation. It's just a way of writing it, okay? So, you put a big P, and the N on the left side, and then there's an R over here, and they'll be numbers. The N and the R will be numbers. You just need to know what the numbers stand for. So, the, the N is like the number of players or the number of whatever, the number of people. I'm just going to put the number of people. And the R represents how many are chosen at a time. 
Okay, back up here with the baseball players, we chose nine of them at a time. And with the swimming lanes, we chose eight of them at a time. You don't have to choose that many at a time, and that's what the R represents, okay? So I'm gonna show you what this means. So we've got this notation, seven and four, okay? So the seven means there are seven people, and we're going to choose them four at a time. That's what that notation means. So we've got seven people, but we only want four of them. So I'm gonna number my people. Okay, so how many choices do we have to go in that spot right there? We have seven choices, all right? I've chosen one. Now, how many choices do we have to go in that spot? Well, there's six people left, so there's six choices. And how many people do we have to go in that third spot? There's one, two, three, four, five people. All right, so I'm gonna mark one off. And then how many do we have to go in this fourth spot? Well, there are four people. All right, and that's all we need. We only need to fill four spots. So this number tells us how many people there are. This number tells us how many of them we need at a time. And so that's just four. So we stop when we get four factors. So this one is seven times six times five times four. And that will be seven times six times five times four gets me 840, okay? So that's all this little notation means. It just tells you where to start and how many to do. So let's look at this one. We've got our big P. We've got nine people taking three at a time. All right, so how many different combinations can we get when we've got nine people and we need to take them three at a time? Well, we'll start with nine, then we'll get to eight, and then there's seven to choose from, and that's it. We only need three of them. So nine times eight times seven is 504. All right. So we've got seven people, and we need to take them three at a time. You just gotta remember what these little numbers down here represent. Seven people or seven things taken three at a time. So we only need three blanks. Two, three, seven, six, and five. And we multiply them together. And we get 210. All right. Oop, nope. Then we've got five things taken two at a time. So we start with five. Then we've got four choices for the second one. That leaves us 20 different ways that we can arrange five things two at a time. That's how I have to look at this. Five things, two at a time. Seven, ten, seven things, three at a time. All right, and you've got some of that on your homework. Um, let's look at number five. It, on the next page, we're on page 682. It says, suppose you use six different letters to make a computer password. Find the number of possible six letter passwords. All right, so we need six letter password. And apparently you can't use the same letter twice, okay? So how many choices would we have for the first letter? We would have 26 choices, because there are 26 letters in the alphabet. How many choices would we have for the second letter? This spot right there. We would have 25 choices, because we've used one of them. How many choices would we have for this spot? We would have 24. How many choices would we have for this spot? 23. How about for that spot? 22. And for that spot? 21. All right. So 
we do some multiplication. We go 26 times 25 times 24 times 23 times 22 times 21. And that, ooh, 1, 6, 5, 7, 6, 5, 6, 0, oh, oh. And then we'll go back and put some commas in there. Is that right? Yep, 600 and, um, 165,765,600 different combinations of six letters in our alphabet. That's a lot of different combinations. Okay, it says, suppose, let's look at check understanding 5A. It says, suppose your cousin needs to choose a four-digit number to use with his new debit card. Find the number of possible four-digit numbers without repeating. All right, so we need four digits. How many digits can we choose from for that first blank? Well, how many digits are there to begin with? Okay. There are 10 digits in our number system. They are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. You can't count 10 because 10 is made out of two digits. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. All right. All right, so we have 10 digits to choose from for the first number. How many do we have for the second number? We have nine, because we've already used one. Then we'll have eight to choose from, and then we'll have seven to choose from. So how many different combinations for a password do we have? All right, 10 times nine times eight times seven. We have 5,040 different combinations of four digit passwords, if you don't repeat any numbers. Let's look at check understanding B. It says, is a six letter password or a six digit number harder for someone to guess? Which do you think, six letters or six numbers? Well, I think six letters because there's a lot more letters to choose from than there are digits. But either one would be fairly difficult because the numbers get pretty high. Okay, so for this this next couple of days, Monday and Tuesday. On Monday, we're gonna work, hang on, let me consult my book here. On Monday, we're gonna work the even problems on your practice 812, 12, eight, sorry, practice 12, eight. You're gonna work the evens and then tomorrow you'll work the odds. And then on Wednesday, we'll have another video lesson and you'll do the same thing. You'll do the evens on Wednesday and the third Thursday, we'll do the odds, okay? So I'll put all this on the Google Classroom.